Hello, <clears throat> I'm CT class. Um, this is our ninth class today, in which we'll be discussing um, the state responsibility under the ILC articles on state responsibility and discuss um, the liability or the potential liability for non state actors um, or terrorist groups with regards to state responsibility. We're having this class virtually um, this week because I will be in London when you'll probably be watching this. And so um, I wanted to still have a little bit of time to discuss with you all um, the very important subject matter that is ILC articles on state responsibility. And um, I will start in one second. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to talk about state responsibility and terrorism today. So let's start with um, the description of what state responsibility is um, and where it comes from. So state responsibility is when a private action becomes a public action. It's when the action of a non-state actor, whether it be a terrorist group or anything else, um, becomes imputed to the country where that terrorist group or that non-state actor is acting in. So an example would be um, in Afghanistan during 9-11, um, the Taliban, actually, that wouldn't be as good of an example. Let's do Iraq. Iraq is harboring Al-Qaeda, um, which is during um, the aftermath of 9-11, which was a pretense under which um, Bush went after um, Saddam Hussein's regime. So that was private actions, Al-Qaeda attacking the United States through um, various attacks, which is a non-state actor. Um, and those acts being imputed to the state where they're acting in, Iraq, um, or the regime that's holding control over that, which is Saddam Hussein's regime, which was rather Saddam Hussein's regime. So that's one example of where a private action, i.e. terrorist action, can become imputed liability for a country. Um, so state responsibility can be dictated in special agreements, um, state responsibility for um, contractual obligations and environmental protections can sometimes come through general agreements on tariffs or GATT agreements. And where the focus of our um, discussion today will be is customary international law um, and the ILC articles on state responsibility or the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. Okay, so what are the two elements of state responsibility under this ILC article on state responsibility. And in order to have any discussion of any kind of non-state actor um, and their actions being imputed or the liability of their actions being imputed to a country, you have to go through these two steps. One, there has to be a breach of an international obligation for the state. And two, whatever the act is has to be attributable to the state under international law. Now, um, to give you an idea about what this means, um, think about it this way. Um, you have, a, a, in order for you to have liability, you have to have one, um, something that you did wrong. So you have to have an internationally wrongful act. Um, and then the second part of the um, attributability or liability is going to be, well, were the actions of this non-state group, um, can they be imputed to the state? And that comes through various um, elements that are listed in the ILC Articles on State Responsibility, which we'll cover today. But just keep in mind um, that the ILC Articles on State Responsibility and generally any argument that you're going to have about attribution has to have these two elements. It has to have one, an internationally wrongful act, and two, attribution or the ability to do attribution um, to the state. Okay, let's go back one second. Okay, um, so international obligation um, and what international obligations are we talking about here? What breach of an international obligation are we talking about here? And the ILC goes through this. First, you have um, a serious breach of an international obligation of essential importance for the maintenance of international peace and security. So that would prohibit aggression, that would prohibit cross-border sort of terrorist actions. Then. Um, a serious breach of an international obligation of essential importance for safeguarding the right of self-determination for peoples. Um, self-determination is a term of art that's used under international law, so you should look that up if you're going to make that argument. Um, it 
can be um, oftentimes confused with sovereignty, which is a separate and distinct issue, but it does have similar um, similar elements to it. But just keep in mind the right to self-determination of peoples, um, the obligation is to maintain that, right? Then you have safeguarding the human being, such as prohibiting slavery, genocide, or apartheid, um, sort of use Kogan's norms, um, big violations of international law. So that would be um, your international obligation is to not let those things happen. And if you have failed your obligation there, then those things have happened and you may be held responsible for them. So if there has been a violation or there has been a case of slavery, there has been a case of genocide, there has been a case of apartheid, even if a non-state actor committed those actions, if it happened within your borders, you may have um, an international obligation here under the ILC Articles on State Responsibility. And finally, the serious breach of an international obligation of essential importance for the safeguarding and preservation of the human environment. So this goes to environmental law, environmental protections. Um, this would be, I think D would be what um, Stetson would be making their argument based off of probably with the international obligation. Um, C would probably be um, what Jessup will be arguing. Uh, I'm sorry, not Jessup. Um, the feral competition would be arguing um, because uh, there are instances, perhaps, of the Yinkin um, militias uh, engaging in slavery or genocide, so that would be C. Um, and then uh, the hack that occurred in the Jessup competition, um, that might affect uh, A, the maintenance of international peace and security, or B, the right to self-determination. Um, so you would have to make an argument sort of based on those. So each, each competition will be focusing on a different international obligation, but just look to the ILC yearbook volume two to find this list. So how do we get to attribution? And we go right to chapter two of the ILC draft articles. If any of you is making an argument for state responsibility, you need to be very much focusing on chapter two and know it very, very well. Um, and so there are different acts that can be attributable to the state or the manner of the actions can be attributable to the state. First, you have the conduct of state organs. That's under article four. So if a state organ, um, the ministry of uh, security, the Ministry of Treasury, the Homeland Security Department, whatever it is, conduct of a state organ that can be attributable to that state, which seems to be very um, obvious and easy. That's the easy one. Um, the conduct of, conduct of per persons exercising elements of governmental authority is the second one, which is under Article 5. So it's individuals who are holding themselves out to be governmental um, governmental uh, representatives or authority, um, and somehow the government has given some credence to that, or given some credibility to that claim. Then you have the conduct of organs placed at the disposal of the state by another state um, under Article 6. Then you have conduct that exceeds the authority or contravenes instructions. So even when a governmental official or a governmental department exceeds their authority or contravenes um, instructions given to them from above, they can the state can still be held liable um, oftentimes for that conduct. Conduct directed or controlled by a state, um, that's a very uh, loose one that's used, Article 8. It's one that's used in almost every argument, so it's something that one has to contend with of making the argument that perhaps the conduct was directed or it was controlled by the state. Um, there are some cases that we'll talk about today that predate the ILC articles on state responsibility. Um, and Article 8 um, sort of speaks to some of the things that were discussed in those cases. So you have um, the case of Nicaragua and you have um, another case that we'll discuss, but essentially that discusses conduct directed or controlled by the state and how much direction or control do you need to prove in order to satisfy the attribution test here, okay? Then you have conduct carried out in the absence or default of official authority. So if the government has conceded a space or left a vacuum in a space where they should have alternatively been taking action and someone else takes action in that vacuum, well then that state may be held liable for that action. Conduct of interactional or you can call them revolutionary movements when those movements eventually take over the state. So even the in-between portion of when rebels are fighting against the state, they can be held liable once they become sort of leaders or the people who control the state. So that's something to keep in mind that even rebels will be held to account for what they've done during the rebellion, even if they win. Um, and then private conduct, with, which is acknowledged and adopted by the state. Article 11 is much like Article 8. It's sort of 
um, ambiguous, it's sort of left a little bit broad and wide, and that's where a lot of the arguments will be um, based out of whether it's um, conduct that's directed or controlled by the state or private conduct which is acknowledged or adopted by the state. Okay, so that covers sort of our um, two-part test here, um, and the two-part test is related um, to this ILC draft articles on state responsibility. Um, and so now I'm going to go through a little bit more of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what there might be defenses for state responsibility. So even if you have an internationally wrongful act, even if that act is attributable, attributable to the state, there are instances where um, that state will have defenses against that. Okay, um, so let's go to the defenses. So you have self-defense. So if the country is acting in self-defense through militias or through non-state actors in order to, to properly and proportionally and necessarily defend themselves, then they can use Article 21 to escape liability. You can have countermeasures um, responding to internationally wrongful acts. So if, if a country is trying to take measures to react to an internationally wrongful act, they might have um, a defense from a violation of, of or rather have an have a defense from the imputation of liability under the ILC articles on state responsibility. You can have force majeure, which is a change in circumstance. You can have distress, you can have um, necessity, and then you can have compliance for preemptory norms. Use Kogan's norms. Um, if a country is trying to obey or abide by their use Kogan's norms, well then we're not gonna hold them necessarily or we'll have give them a defense from attribution or state responsibility or, or any violation thereof. So now let's give, I'll give you an example. Before we go into the terrorism examples, I want to give an example for corporate actors. Um, and corporate actors, oftentimes, the liability for their actions relates to environmental harms or envi environmental damage that, excuse me, that's done. And so here, under Article 8 of the ILC, which we mentioned before, which I mentioned before, um, uh, this is a scholar that's making this argument. They're saying that in the commentaries, the finals, state responsibility articles, the ILC concluded that as a general rule, the conduct of private persons and corporations is not attributable to the state under public international law. In sum, this means that the actions of a private corporation can only be attributed to a state under Article 8 in a very exceptional circumstance. Such circumstances should, be, um, should demonstrate explicit control and direction exercised by the state over the impugned actions of the transnational corporation. So you have a very sort of high bar for corporate, um, for liability of a state for things that are done by a corporation, whether it's an oil spill, whether it's anything else. The only way that you can hold a state liable is that you can demonstrate explicit control and direction exercised by the state over the corporation. So that's one way or one angle of looking at state responsibility um, as it relates to corporate actors and as it relates to environmental damage and harm, something that the Stetson people might be looking into later on in their research. Now let's proceed and let's talk about um, uh, sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to attribution. And attribution oftentimes deal with, with this issue of state responsibility for terrorism. Um, so really there, there are a few questions that are asked, major questions that are asked for terrorism. Um, one is that, is there sort of a positive duty for countries to take action to prosecute terrorists? Some would argue that if you fail to properly prosecute or work with the international community to prosecute terrorists, you can in fact be held liable for their actions. Now this is a very different way of looking at international law, which generally requires countries not to do something. Don't violate use Kogan's norms. Don't violate treaties. Here, we're saying you must, in fact, take positive action to prosecute or work with the international community concerning terrorism. So let's talk about the imputation of liability for terrorism. I'm going to have some scholarly articles for you all to look at, and I have links for them for you all to use in your research. But let's get into this. Okay. So, state responsibility for non-state actors. What happens when terrorists are carrying out abuses of international law? Um, what happens if they're using a country for a safe haven? What happens, uh, or is there a positive duty to prosecute a violation, or rather a failure to prosecute 
does that impute liability of terrorist actions to a state? So it's very important to look at the several UN security resolutions that have come out addressing terrorism. First, you have the UN Security Resolution 1373. It states, member states must implement a number of measures intended to enhance their legal and institutional ability to counter terrorist activities. Resolution 1624 pertains to the incitement to commit terrorism, calling on UN member states to prohibit by law and prevent such conduct and deny safe haven to terrorists and terrorist insiders. So these are putting out positive duties that the UN member states must do. Then you have the UN World Summit Outcome Doctrine, which, in which the nations condemn terrorism and uh, put forth the sort of objective to take on terrorism uh, through law, through prosecutions, etc. So that's uh, sort of the general um, few UN security resolutions I've mentioned here that speak to terrorism and speak to the obligation, the positive obligation of states to deal with terrorists. So let's move forward. Um, for the attribution of terrorist acts, we'll go through a couple tests. We'll go through, discuss the ILC Article 4, we'll discuss ILC Article 8, um, we'll discuss the Nicaragua test, and we'll also discuss one of the tests um, that was put forth by a um, ad hoc tribunal. So first let's go through ILC Article 4, um, which is the members of state organs. This is the hardest um, to hold or to find here um, because really um, non-state actors are generally not members of the state organ. They aren't necessarily employed by the states. Uh, even if the state is using them as proxies, right? So even if the state is under the table using non-state actors, militias, et cetera, et cetera, to carry out um, international terrorist acts which violate international law, which are an internationally wrongful act under the ILC articles on state responsibility, they don't put them on sort of the official payrolls. So it's very difficult without proof that in fact this person was a member of the state organ um, to give, to have impugned liability for the state when it's a non-state actor, when it's a terrorist group. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Individuals can be de jure members of the state organ or de facto members of the state organ. They can be by law or by actual, just in the operation of how they exist, sort of. Um, but again, with the de facto, the ICJ didn't find that link in Serbia, and the de facto is probably the hardest case to make. Again, to go back, the de jure members of the state organ would be the Minister of Education, the Assistant Minister of Education, anyone who falls under a, a official title, right? So that's the de jure members. De facto members are going to be members who don't have an official recognition, but are, are in fact working at the behest, control, or for the government organs, state organs. So in Nicaragua, in, um, Nicaragua, the um, ICJ looked at that there must be lacking any real autonomy, and the bond between the state and the non-state actor must be shown to be so substantial and pervasive that it is virtually indistinguishable from a legal relationship between a state and its own official. That is, by all means, a um, very, very high bar to meet. So when you're looking at the attribution of um, terrorist acts under ILC Article 4, what you have from the Nicaragua case is a very, very high threshold to meet. You have to prove that that non-state actor lacked any real autonomy. You have to prove that the bond between the non the terrorist actor and the state is so substantial that it's indistinguishable from the legal relationship between the state and its own officials. So that's very high uh, as a bar to meet, generally speaking, um, which oftentimes you won't be able to do um, with the facts that you have. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so then we have three other tests on, other than the ILC um, Article 4. We have the ILC Article 8, which is agents of the state. We have the Nicaragua test or the effective control test. The Nicaragua case gives you um, sort of, if you're arguing from um, the state defending themselves from an accusation of supporting a terrorist group or being imputed liability for a terrorist group's actions, the state is only liable under Nicaragua and the effective control test if it gave directions and exercised effective control over the non-state group or actor to take a specific action. 
Again, just like with the other Article 4 test, the effective control test here is a very high bar to meet. The state can only be liable if you have proof that they gave directions and exercised control over this non-state actor. Now, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia prevent, presents a different test, uh, and a test that I would use probably as an accuser, as a person who's saying, hey, non-state actors, what they're doing actually, their liability should be imputed to the state. And the reason is because the state has overall control. So instead of effective control in contravention or contradiction of that, the ICTY put forth the overall control test. The state is liable if it had overall control over the non-state groups and actors. So I want you to think of the difference here. On one side, you have effective control where you have to have proof that the state gave directions and exercised effective control over the group versus the overall control test, which is the state is liable if it had overall control of the non-state actors. One is a high bar, one is a lower bar. One you use as a respondent, one you use as an applicant, I think. Um, so along with the ILC, which you certainly should be looking at from top to bottom in chapter two, articles four through 11, you should know them very well. You should apply all their tests. And beyond that, you have Nicaragua, you have the ICTY. And so you can put forth either test to be adopted by the court. That's sort of um, up to you and your persuasiveness um, with regards to which, which uh, standard the tribunal should adopt. And so, you know, you'd argue for one or the other probably. Um, and so let's go forward then. Um, okay. So then you have two questions that you're gonna ask yourself when you have the attribution of terrorist acts. One is sort of easier to escape liability from, one is sort of harder to escape liability from. So you have one, the inability, inability to punish or prevent. Then you have the unwillingness to punish or prevent. So first, let's talk about the inability. As the court did in the genocide, the Serbian genocide cases, uh, which you should all look up if you're looking up attribution of non-state actors, um, it talks about genocidal acts, but they also can apply for terrorist acts. So as the court did in the genocide cases, it will likely consider the ability of the state to exercise control over its subjects, the ability to control um, the territory, the people who live in that territory, and its non-state terrorist actors. If a nation is seen as ill-equipped and poor, then it will be less likely to be held liable for the acts of terrorism uh, that non-state actors commit. So um, your inability to punish and prevent can allow you to escape liability, at least at the international realm, but there is a duty, um, even if you have the inability. If you are unable, then you must seek help from the international community. You must seek assistance from the international community to try and close the gap and try and prevent terrorism and prosecute terrorism. So you might be able to escape liability with regards to you actually being held liable for the actions of non-state actors, but you do have a uh, parallel sort of obligation, which is that you should seek help from the international community if you don't have the ability to prevent or punish terrorism. Now, the second one is the one where you can get uh, very quickly, the state can get imputed liability for a terrorist action. So it's the unwillingness to punish or prevent. The unwillingness uh, argument comes up in Stetson, the unwillingness argument is going to come up in Jessup. The unwillingness argument is going to come, in, come up in Farrell. And so if the court finds the state has the ability to prevent or punish, so it has the ability to prevent or punish, but it's unwilling to do so, the state can be held liable under Article 11 for conduct that is acknowledged by the state as its own. So there's a very important distinction and a very important thing to know essentially for this argument that while if you're unable to prevent or punish and you make that argument, you can escape liability. If it's proven that you have the ability, but you're just unwilling to prevent or punish, then we're going to go directly to ILC Article 11 and you have perhaps a better case for imputed liability. So when, for example, in the Stetson Compromise, the state specifically says, we are not going to punish. We are not going to um, put a certain group um, who's committing criminal actions by doing poaching, 
we're not going to put them in jail and we're not going to take any further action. So that might bring you to the fact that they're able because the country that makes this claim has a very stable system. They have $6.5 trillion in GDP. So they're a big country. They're pretty well to do. So they have the ability to prevent and punish this action. And yet they are unwilling to do so. That brings you to Article 11, and that can bring you to the attribution um, under ILC, um, Articles on State Responsibility. So let's move forward. Uh, okay. So let's go through some scholarly analysis. And I want to present this to you because I want you all to look at this on your own time. I'm giving you three articles here that are very, very good um, in examining sort of the liability for terrorist actions, perhaps. So uh, this individual states that before taking any action, the injured state must show the host state has either effective or overall control that goes beyond mere financing and equipping of such forces and involves also participation in the planning and supervision of military operations carried out by the private armed group. So this is essentially saying that um, if you want to take action against another country because you think that country is in fact supporting terrorism, then you have to be able to prove not just that they're merely financing them. You have to prove that they're equipping the forces and they're actually supervising and planning them, um, planning their actions as they go forward. An alternative way, he argues, of um, establishing responsibility to determine the host state has explicitly ratified the private conduct and adopted it as its own. So state responsibility for harboring and supporting terrorist groups is unsettled, but it is not precluded. So the harboring and supporting of terrorist groups without actually directly financing or controlling them, he would argue, can still be argued under international law and international law concerning the attribution of actions by non-state actors to a country, to a state. Um, and then another professor, she puts forward a separate delict rule or delict rule, um, which is that the state f fails to fulfill a legal obligation to prevent wrongful conduct by private individuals. The state is, quote, responsible for having violated not the, co not the international obligation with which the individual's action might be in contradiction, but the general or specific obligation imposing on its organs a duty to provide protection. So what does that mean? Um, it means that a country might not be held liable for a terrorist action itself, but it will be held liable for failing to prosecute a terrorist group who committed that action. So it's sort of a different way of looking at it, but still related. Okay, um, when you're doing an attribution analysis, you're gonna refer back to a two-part test. What if any internationally wrongful act has occurred, so what is the internationally wrongful act? And two, can that act be attributed um, in any way described in articles four through 11 of the ILC articles on state responsibility or the Nicaragua case or the ICTY case? Um, and so you're gonna ask yourself the question, what has the state done? One moment, I'm gonna be right back. I have to answer the door. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let's gonna we're, so we're gonna go through um, a two-part attribution analysis, and we're gonna refer back to a two-part test, right? So we're gonna do what's the internationally wrongful act, if any, and then can that act be attributed to the state itself? So let's go through the examples of each of the compromises that we have um, for us here. One second, get back to that. Okay, so referral. I think the question is going to be, is the Republic of Yinka, which is a country, responsible for the Yinkin mil militia's actions? There was Yinkin farmers and rebels who were running around the country. Is Yinka responsible for their actions? What are the internationally wrongful acts? That's the first thing you have to put out. That's the first thing you have to prove. 
So the international wrongful acts, I think, for the militia are, are quite easy in comparison to some of the other actions for Stetson or Jessup. You have the use of child soldiers, which is absolutely a violation.